The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom. Always something, huh? Oh, hey. Welcome, everybody, to your own book show on this Monday evening. Third show in a, in a row, after three days in a row. We'll take a break tomorrow, and we'll be back with you on Wednesday. So um, hope everybody's doing well. Everybody's uh, had a good weekend. You're not too traumatized by uh, COVID uh, and by Trump being in and out of hospital. Uh, I was tempted to talk today about uh, Trump and COVID, but I couldn't actually bring myself to do it. So, the yeah, I'm not. The only thing I was going to say was, you know, I'd like to get that drug that he got on uh, on Saturday or whatever if I ever get COVID. That uh, antibody treatment. Uh, I guess you have to be president to get that. It's not not available to us mere mortals, but. Um, I think that's a very, very promising treatment from everything I've read, and hopefully, hopefully will become a much more widely available. All right, so we are taking a step back from politics today. We're taking a step back from uh, <clears throat> the craziness <clears throat> that's going on in the world around us, from the election, from debates, from COVID, and all of that. Uh, abortion, we've talked about abortion recently, nihilism. And today's show is devoted to a completely positive topic today, all positive. We're going to be talking about basically applying objectivism in your life, applying objectivist primarily. We will talk about uh, ethics and applying the objectivist ethics in your life. But um, but it's, you know, living objectivism. And it's in, we're going to focus on uh, your life. We're going to focus on uh, how this applies to business. We'll see how we weave those two in. Usually those are kind of, I, I do those separately, but we'll kind of weave them in in terms of both business and life. And uh, yeah, hopefully hopefully this is something uh, something that uh, is, uh, is a value to you. Today is part one. I expect this to take, we will see, but uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I don't know, something like that episode. So we'll do this. We're going to do this slowly. We're going to do this thoroughly. We're going to discuss a, a bunch of different issues and a bunch of different topics uh, related to this. Uh, we're going to, again, we're going to, as we integrate into business, we'll also touch on some topics with regard to leadership. All of this really will apply to leadership and what leadership looks like and, and what it means to be a leader, and particularly uh, a leader in a kind of... Um, uh, in the context of an organization, a business organization, which has a clear, with a clear uh, goal and a clear mission and, and, and clear what it wants to do. Um, so, so that's kind of the plan. We'll, we will get into the virtues. We'll probably uh, do a show on each one of the vo- virtues, again, applying them both to your individual life and applying them to business. All of this is sponsored by Troy from Australia who uh, has uh, funded this series of programs. So uh, he, he got to set the, uh, the topic. Uh, but so what I'd like is at least, thanks, Brian, at least uh, to start off with, let's try to focus on questions related to the issue, related to the topic on the Super Chat. Uh, but we can expand it beyond that once, uh, you know, uh, as we go. Of course, uh, questions that are directly related will get priority and questions that have large dollar signs next to their name next to the question will get uh priority so super chat is where you want to be if you're on facebook you should come over to youtube where you can actively ask these questions and be engaged in the uh in the conversation and in on on the chat here and uh, and be able to ask questions using the super chat all right um let's see uh anything else that we have to cover before we get to that uh, I will be doing a show on Wednesday. Um, yeah, no, I think we're good. I think we're good to go. I can't think of any other kind of, uh, you know, don't forget the usual. Don't forget to like the show. Don't forget to share. But like, 
liking is good um, as we go along. Don't forget, before you leave, I know some of you leave early. Before you leave, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and, um, uh, and so on. All right. Where do we start? <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's important to note that Ayn Rand talked about a philosophy, talked about objectivism. As a philosophy for living life on earth, as a philosophy for living. And what does that mean? It means a, a, a philosophy that will guide your life, that will provide you with the principles, with the ideas that can enhance your life, enhance your ability to live a, a good life. And we'll talk about what a good life is and, and what that means exactly, but she did not write philosophy for the sake of writing philosophy. She did not write philosophy for the sake of, um, you know, engaging in difficult, interesting ideas, uh, for the sake of participating in the debate, for the sake of, uh, you know, solving any kind of long-lost puzzles. She was interested. She was interested. And what does it mean in a sense, to be a hero, what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be, uh, you know, a, a, a fully fleshed out, a, a fully living individual human being? What does it mean to live with a capital L? And she needed that knowledge, <laughs> one, to live herself, but I think to some extent she already had that knowledge for herself implicitly, even if she hadn't exactly spelt it out explicitly. But where she needed to express it explicitly was in her characters, in her novels. And she talks about the fact that in order to portray her, 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 her goal was to portray a, a, the perfect man, and in order to portray the perfect man, she had to know what a perfect man was, and she had to articulate what a perfect man was in writing, in detail in action, in values. And that really entailed figuring out what all that meant. And when she looked around at other philosophies, when she looked around at other philosophers, when she examined all of their writings, she couldn't find what she was looking for. And she realized that the ideas she, in a sense, held implicitly she needed to make explicit first in order to make her characters come alive and, and for her to fully flesh out her characters. And then um, she needed, she wanted to do it because there was this gap and she wanted to fully understand it and then share that knowledge with the rest of us so that, you know, in a sense, once she discovered that there was no philosophy really that matched her heroes, I think she probably understood, I don't know this really, but she probably understood why there was such a shortage of heroes in the world around her and why the world was going in the awful rotten direction that it seemed to be going. And that the way to change that direction was not political, was fundamentally, essentially long-term it was philosophical. It was to, to, to educate people about what an ideal man, what living really meant and why, and, and, and what would be in, in involved in embracing life. So her idea, her, her whole philosophy is um, built around a practical need, the practical need of us to understand the world around us, understand ourselves, and to live the best life that we can live. And it's based on the knowledge that as human beings, we do not have, we do not have the programming necessary, the, the knowledge necessary to achieve that kind of life. It's not programmed. We do not have the knowledge to survive. It's not programmed. And this is a, a really, really important observation she makes. It seems simple and straightforward, but given the world in which we live, where 
determinism is rampant and, and uh, kind of uh, evolutionary behavioral um, uh, evolutionary explanations for behavior are all over the place. So evolutionary explanations for our success as a species are all over the place where evolution uh, it, it, it dominates in terms of an explanation. Evolutionary psychology is a whole field that tries to explain everything that is, is in our world and how we live and describes everything about us. It's really important to note that Ayn Rand rejects all that, and indeed there's no evidence for it. Rand recognizes that individuals have free will and that we are born without the knowledge of how to survive. We must acquire that knowledge. And much of a philosophy about is about how to do that. What kind of a knowledge is worthy of acquiring? And how we go about doing that. So we are born, it's not that we're born tabula rasa in a sense that we're born with nothing inside. But we're born without knowledge. The knowledge to survive, the knowledge to feed ourselves, the knowledge to... To, to, to survive in a world with animals that want to kill us, to survive other human beings who would like to take our stuff and attack us. We're not born with those kind of instincts, with that kind of survival knowledge built into our DNA as other animals are. Other animals do not have to acquire knowledge in order to learn to survive. They don't have to figure it out. They use their consciousness to observe reality and, and the programming, in a sense, does the rest in terms of guiding it to what, guiding them to what they need to do in order to survive. It's built in. Human beings, it's not built in. So we need to acquire knowledge. And our survival is not self-evident because of that. So we are constantly faced with this alternative of life or death. Now, every being is faced, every living being, and this is what, you know, what differentiates life from non-life is life can end. A rock is always a rock. It's not alive, it's just a rock. But a flower will die. And if it doesn't get enough water, it'll die sooner rather than later. So we are faced constantly with this alternative as life or death, survival or not survival destruction or existence and because we do not have the tools to automatically know what survival requires as a flower does you know a flower not only needs the water but would actually look for the water i don't know about a flower but certainly a tree or a plant you plant it in the soil and its branches go out seeking the water they don't make the decision to seek the water they just do so because they're programmed to do it. But they go searching that which will allow them to survive, which will allow them to grow, which will allow them to thrive as a tree. Sunlight, water, nutrients that, they, that the plant needs. Animals know exactly what and how to do in order to survive, in order to stay alive, in order to not go out of existence. But it doesn't come automatically to us. As human beings, we must make an effort to figure it out. Right? It's, it's not automatic. So we face this fundamental alternative. But once we choose to live, and again, even there, we must choose to live. Animals don't choose to live. They just do. So once we choose to live, we have to figure out how to live. We have to go and seek those things that promote our life, and we need to learn to avoid those things that destroy our lives. And indeed, values. Values are those things that we seek, those things that we 
you know, the, 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 more gen the most general definition of, uh, of, of values is that which one acts to gain or keep. It's those things which one seeks for oneself or preserves for oneself. And when it comes to within the context of objectivism, values are those things we act to gain or keep for the purpose of our life, for the purpose of living, for the purpose of our existence, for the purpose of our thriving, for the purpose of successfully being alive. And that's, that's the beginning of, that's ethics. Ethics is figuring out what those values are and what the virtues, what the actions we must take in order to preserve, in order to achieve the values that are necessary for our existence. But at every step, it's not given. It's not automatic. It must be activated. It must be engaged. We must make an effort. We must choose to think about what will preserve our life, what will further our, what will further our lives, and how to attain it. So ethics is studying the principles involved here. And, and Rand defines ethics as a code of values to guide man's choice and actions, the choices and actions that determine the purpose and the course of man's life. So the important, the things that really make a difference, the things that, those values that shape, those choices, those actions that are going to shape your life. Ethics deals with those choices. A code of values to guide man's choices and actions. Which choices and actions? The choices and actions that determine the purpose and course of your life. Let me just silence somebody because not productive on topics like this to have uh, just, uh, there we go. Okay, so, you know, why is this important? Why do we need this? Well, because we don't have it automatic. But also because life's complicated. There's a lot of choices. There's a lot of options. There are a lot of values one could pursue. There's a lot of things one could do with one's time. There's a lot of ways one can live or not live. And most people never codify for themselves a, a system of ethics. Most people never actually think through these questions and come up with a list of values and virtues and live by it and use it as a tool to live. And then they're kind of stuck. They're stuck in this world in which they do what they're told or what they're taught by others without examining it, without thinking it through, without inspecting it, without making sure that it's right. Or, and or, because usually it's a combination of these, they land up doing what works in the moment because that's the easiest. That doesn't require long-term thinking. And most of the time, we don't have time to do the long-term thinking. What do we call that when we don't think long-term, when we don't use principles, in this case, moral principles, to guide what we do, but what we use is just, you know, just calculations in the moment of what seems to work here and now. What is, what is, that, what is that called? I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, I can get away with this lie right now. They're not going to catch me. They didn't catch me last time. I'll just lie right now. I'll just cut this corner or cut that corner. And why is lying bad anyway? Because my mother told me, because the priest said so. I don't know if I believe in God, and if there's no God, why shouldn't I cheat? There's no heaven. There's no hell. 
Well, it's called, I mean, and, and, and I think most people identify this as pragmatism. It's pragmatic. It gets me the results. I have these short-term aims. I do these short-term things, and it gets me that short-term result. It's guided often by whim. It's guided by what you call, you know, some people call intuition, which is just another name for whim in many cases. Not always, but in many cases. It's pragmatism. And for most people, that's how they live because, again, life is complicated. And going through the whole question of, okay, if I lie, what are the consequences? Who potentially could catch me? Is this going to necessitate other lies? If I get caught, what are the consequences? What does it do to my consciousness if I start lying and if I lie regularly? What is, I mean, there's a lot to think about on every single one of these decisions versus, for example, a principle. Lying's bad for me. I figured that out. I've solved that problem. I know that, you know, in these contexts, it's lies, lying is always bad. I don't have to think about it. I just don't lie. I know the answer. And I'm not dogmatic about it because I keep going back and reaffirming the principle by integrating into the rest of my knowledge and making sure that, yes, it's true. So most of the world out there, certainly in business, certainly in business, most of the world out there is seduced by pragmatism. They don't want to buy into kind of the, the conventional uh, or, 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 the, or the, the, the kind of stringent view of, of, uh, of sacrifice, of sacrificing to others, of ethics. And, and they don't have any other guidance of how to live their life. So I'll just wing it. I'll just wing it. I'll just solve problems on the fly. I'll figure it out as we go along. So uh, pragmatism is a, is, a, is, a, is a real issue out there in the culture, and particularly in business. I mean, a pragmatic businessman doesn't think about the long term. They, they don't have time. It's too complicated. Maybe on some issues they think long term, but if, on most, you just... You, and, and to think about the consequences of every action he takes, too overwhelming, too hard. So he makes decisions without those considerations he shifts the blame for his mistakes he downplays the extent of problems covers them up tries to cover them up altogether and when the problems show up later there's more cover-up so there's no blaming to somebody else and ultimately you know they might lose their job or they might the company might fail but by then it's hard to attribute it to a decision that was made months or years or even decades sometimes earlier. You know, a, a businessman of principle is focused on producing values. He's, for example, concerned about his, his reputation. You know, if he runs his company well, he's going to build a good reputation as good manager, and over time, he'll be able to raise more capital, he'll be able to increase the company's value, his own value, his own compensation. He'll have pride in what he's achieved. He, when he makes a bad decision, he owns up to it. As soon as he recognizes a mistake, he takes remedial steps to restore the company's performance. He fixes it. He deals with issues on a principled level based on his and the company's long-term interests. The long-term is built into his perspective. And you can see that, you can see that failed companies, even companies that commit fraud, and they get into real trouble, are companies that are typically not run by crooks. It's not that the company is run by a CEO who sets out to steal from shareholders. Almost always, they're a consequence of pragmatism of little lies, of little 
you know, deceptions, of just not being willing to step forward and recognize a mistake or to accept a mistake. Little evasions, little, well, not little, but short-term thinking. Yeah, I'll give you an example. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember WorldCom. And there, there were a bunch of, there was a series of a big um, uh, fraud cases in the early 2000s among a whole set of companies. There was a lot of these companies where, where kind of fraud was committed. And when you actually examine what the fraud was, it wasn't the case that a CEO sat down, let's say like, like, uh, like um, uh, Bernie Madoff, and said, how do I defraud my customers? How do I cheat them? How do I take their money? And I'm not sure exactly if that's how Bernie Madoff, even with Bernie Madoff, that happened. Usually what happened was, uh, so, you know, a company like WorldCom was doing really well. The stock was high. They'd reported better earnings every quarter. They were doing fantastically well. And then they had a bad quarter. And you could just report the bad quota and, and stock price would have gone down and people would have questioned their performance and challenged them in terms of what they were doing, but they probably would have done fine. But what happened when they had a bad quota was the CEO might have looked at that and said, look, you know, why report this? It's a headache. I'll have to explain it to shareholders. People will harass me. I mean, it's just a little thing. It's no big deal. And I know, I know. The next quarter will be better. The things will recover. And next quarter, when things are better, we'll report slightly less than the increase so that if you add the two quarters up, it's the same. So we'll do what some people call um, income, or, or income smoothing. And there's even, yeah, expressions for this to, to, to make the evasion seem scientific, uh, consistent with accounting practices. Anyway, you do this, and the next quarter, the following quarter, is even worse. But now you're kind of locked in. You don't want to record two, you don't want to report this quarter's loss, and then you're going to have to report last quarter's loss, and then they're going to catch you about last quarter's loss. So what do you do? Well, you do it again. You lie a little bit, believing that when things get better, I'll fix it. When things get better, we'll smooth it all out and nobody will care. And of course, things get worse. And in the end, you land up in jail. That's pragmatism. Little lies, not big ones. There's a famous case of a trader in Singapore who bought down one of the oldest banks, financial institutions, in, uh, in uh, the United Kingdom. And how did he bring it back? He had trading authority and he was, he was trading options on the Nikkei, which is the, the, stock, the, the index of the stock market in Japan. And he, he had taken a big loss, a kind of loss that would have resulted in a demotion. And he didn't want a demotion. He didn't want a demotion. So he doubled up, thinking... I'll make it all back and nobody will know. And he lost again. Now he'd lost enough to lose his job. And he really didn't want to lose his job. So he doubled up again <laughs> and lost again. And now he was probably going to jail. So he doubled up one more time and lost and that's guaranteed that he went to jail in Singapore. Not, not, not a pleasant experience, I promise you. But the loss by that point was so large that it brought down one of the oldest financial institutions in the United Kingdom. But those kind of little decisions, pragmatic, short-term, unprincipled, not thinking about the wider context, is what brings people down. The lies that a husband tells a wife or a wife tells a husband that build over time will ultimately lead to a divorce. Little deceptions will ultimately lead you out of a company 
And when you add those up in terms of the effect it has on your life, ultimately, they lead to the destruction of your own life. We need principles. We need some kind of guidance to tell us how to deal with the complexity of the world, how to deal with everything that we encounter. Because again, you know, we don't have the scope or the time to think about the, the, the principles involved, the, the scope of human psychology and, and uh, uh, the scope of uh, history to know exactly what works and what doesn't, what's right and what's wrong, what sustains human life and what doesn't, what's achievable, what's, what's good and what's not. It's an achievement to figure those things out, particularly in terms of principles. And it's why... You know, it's why we need, why we need ethics. Ethics are the broader sense of principles that guide our life. And then we can apply those principles, those ethical principles, to different areas in our life. You know, how to, how to run a business, how to deal with employees, or how to make business decisions. And we can think about principles of marriage, how to have a good, healthy relationship with the person you're going to live with for a long, long time, how to maybe have a relationship with kids or whatever. You can apply, you have a broad set of principles that apply to life, and then you take that and build principles that apply those abstract principles to particular issues that you're going to face. Moral principles enable us to choose the right course of action. It takes into account real life choices that you have. And it tells us the consequences to expect given the choices we might make. It organizes all that information, all the different possibilities, all the different branches of the tree of decision making that we could make. It organizes that into simple well, and maybe not so simple, but into rules, into principles that we can then follow. Again, now follow blindly, understand, integrate, prove to ourselves that they're true, that they work, that they're efficacious, and then follow. If you don't have moral principles telling you what is right or wrong, what is essential to judging any given situation, how do you know what to do? How do you know what not to do? How do you know how to live? All right. So that's the role of ethics. The role of ethics is to provide us with principles on how to live, on what right and wrong is. In other words, what we should and what we shouldn't do. Right? Now, Objectivism is a specific set of principles that guide this. What's interesting, I always find interesting, is if you look at alternative moral systems, usually they just provide you with a set of um, a set of very abstract um, commandments, or sometimes very concrete commandments, but just commandments. This is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. Very rarely do they provide you with general principles. And when they do, it, it's something like live for the sake of others. Think about their well-being. Take care of them. Be selfless. And that's altruism. But most ethical theories, most ethical theories we find are altruistic. Altruism is the other-ism. There's no science. There's no thinking. There's no induction. There's no learning from experience or learning from reality or learning from what works because what is the standard for what works? They don't have a standard. 
They stand as the well-being of, I don't know, society, God, something. But what does that even mean? What is the meaning of the well-being of society? What is the meaning of the well-being of God? Who knows that? How do you know that? Objectivism is, unbelie- is anchored in reality, in human life, in human survival. So the standard is clear. The standard for figuring out what the principle should be is life. It's living. It's even surviving. Even at the very, very basic of the most basic form of survival. What do we need in order to just survive? at the very most basic need. Well, we need food. We need warmth. Once we leave the savanna in Africa, we need some warmth. Those are the kind of basics. Right? Well, how do we get food? You know, and I've used this example many times, but, you know, we're a pretty pathetic animal for food getting. Right? We're weak. We're slow. We have no food. Things, we have no claws, we, we, we don't have the capacity to just go out there and get food. And if we do, it's like picking nuts and berries and maybe somehow chasing down some really slow animals. But you don't, you don't, build, you don't build a human population, you don't build civilization, you don't really survive as human beings at that level, on that basis. So one has to have some... Something else. Something else that makes it possible. For us to survive as a species. Nothing, nothing is programmed. So what do we do? Because, you know, you, you try chasing down a bison and biting into it, and you're not going to get it very far. You don't have the tools for any of that. Naveen says, speak for yourself, you're wrong. Well, you try chasing down a bison. (laughs) It ain't working. Saber-toothed tiger would have eaten you a long time ago. And yet, here we are. (laughs) Watching this over the internet, all over the world. I don't know how many countries are represented on the chat right now, but all from all over the world. In a comfortable dwelling, whether it's hot or cold outside, We have air conditioning or heating. If it's raining, we have a roof. How do you even, how do you get that kind of warmth, that kind of shelter, all of that? Where does it come from? Why it says we're tool-making species, yes, but you have the instinct. Anybody have the gene for tool-making? I don't know how to make tools. I wouldn't know where to begin. I mean, I could do what? I could figure it out. I could figure out how to make tools. If my life depended on it. And by the way, my life does depend on it. So what makes it possible for us to survive? What makes it possible for us to hunt? What makes it possible for us to grow agriculture? What makes it possible for us to do any of these things? Is our capacity to figure stuff out. It's our capacity to think, not just to identify what's out there in the world, but to integrate that knowledge and to apply that knowledge and to change our environment to fit ourselves. Zybin64, I will have you know that I've changed many attire in my life. I don't know. So it is our capacity to think that makes it possible for us to hunt, for us to build, to make tools, to make weapons, to figure out, like no other species have figured out, how to grow stuff, plant seeds, water them, create agriculture. I mean, the genius that went into any one of those discoveries is stunning. The 
the wheel, since tires were mentioned, the invention of the wheel, the progress that that led to, somebody had to do it. Somebody had to figure it out. Somebody had to use his mind in order to create, build, make, and thus enable civilization, and thus enable a large population of human beings on the planet that create, build, make, and that today we enjoy the, the, the sum of their products. So if we're interested in survival, building, creating, making, living well, if that's the standard, then I think the crucial discovery is that what that requires is reason, the use of our reason, the application of reason. to our lives. So, reason being the faculty that identifies and integrates the material provided by man's senses, but it doesn't do it passively. It doesn't do it automatically. To identify and to integrate requires effort, requires choice, requires engagement, requires taking control. So for Rand, for objectivism, the number one principle for living is to think. It's to use your mind. It's to seek, to apply reason in all of one's activities. So reason is a cardinal value. Values are that which one acts to gain or keep. Well, reason is something one has to act to attain, to achieve. Right? And that requires thinking, thinking, thinking. Right? And of course we have to focus that thinking in particular directions. We have to know why we're doing what we're doing. That is a purpose. Everything we do in life must have a purpose. I mean, the most basic purpose is our life. It's to live. And ultimately, it's to live successfully. It's to live happily. To do that, we must think. We must think towards a particular purpose. We must use our reason and apply it towards a particular goal, a particular aim, a particular outcome. And we will get in later into central purpose and all that. But here, we need some reason for applying our thinking. And we must have a sense that this world is ours, that we can survive in this world, thrive in this world, be happy in this world, succeed in this world. And that's the reward of our reason. But it's something that has to be attained, it, that self-confidence, that sense of belonging, that sense of this is my world, has to be attained. It has to be gained. And that is the third cardinal value. So for Rand, there are three cardinal values. Reason, purpose, self-esteem. And if you attain these values, then what you attain is a life worth living. What you attain is ultimately happiness and success, success in the most you know, fundamental sense, success at living, at being alive. And, and the reward of that success is happiness. So the purpose at the end of the day is happiness. To achieve that happiness, one has to pursue 
the, the moral purpose of one's life is happiness, and one has to pursue these values, reason, purpose, self-esteem. And the particular ways in which we are going to pursue or should pursue these values, and we'll talk about that, we'll start talking about that next time with the uh, objectivist virtues. So we'll go through the virtues and apply them. Now, let's quickly talk about business in this context. A business, a business needs <clears throat> values. It needs a purpose. Uh, uh, for a business, uh, you know, one can frame, or put it this way, for a business, one can frame the question in terms of survival as well. A business can survive and grow and thrive, or it can fail and, in a sense, die. Survival for a business is not automatic. None of the knowledge required for a business to succeed is gained automatically. It must be discovered. It must be figured out. It must be achieved. So business, just like a human being, must, the, the human beings within the business, must apply the same kind of values to the life of this entity, it's a legal entity, in order for it to be able to be successful. A business must be guided by reason. A business must have a clear purpose. And a business must, you know, needs to survive with the kind of confidence, with the kind of energy, with the kind of, you know, that, you know, you don't really talk about self-esteem in the context of business, but you can imagine the kind of confidence and that a business would project if it was run and and uh, and and had an explicit philosophy, explicit philosophy driving it. And life for business requires it requires profit, and the purpose of the business, at least a significant part of a purpose for business, has to be profit. Because without profit, life as a business is impossible. So we're going to look at how we apply the objectivist virtues to business because they do. They all apply. One has to run a business based on reason. One has to run a business honestly and independently. And one has to have pride in one's business in order for it to be successful, which means taking all those other virtues seriously and trying to attain them consistently. So as we go through it, we'll try to apply the different virtues in a business context. And I'll share with you some ways in which other businesses have tried to do this. But to a large extent, because business is a human business, because business is about individuals, it's about individuals pursuing their values, you know, one can map the virtues of morality and apply them to virtues within a business context. And we're going to be doing that as we move forward. All right, we are going to take some, we're going to go to Super Chat and uh, we will continue with this next time. We will jump into kind of the virtues. Uh, we'll probably do a show on each one of the virtues and try to apply them. Uh, in your life, we'll think of examples. If you have examples or, that you want to share or if you've got specific questions on application of any of these virtues, then uh, that would be great. Uh, concretizing these things is really, really important. Giving them life. So I, I'm eager to hear your experiences, your challenges, your questions. What does morality, what does the objective morality mean to you? How do you apply it? How do you think about it? But you want to get to a point where you apply it everywhere. And, and, and let me just say this. I, I talked about this earlier today when I gave a talk. Um, one of the things that you need to um, practice if you take morality seriously is um, self-monitoring. You need to be able to monitor yourself. So, for example, you make a decision 
you should really think about that decision and say, was I really being rational? Did I take into account all the evidence? Was I being influenced by anybody else? Was I second-handed in any way? And you might say to yourself, you know, I wasn't completely independent. I let other people influence my decision. Now, it's really important to do that. Not in a way to say, bad, you're on. Don't, you know, don't do that again. And, you know, slap you around. Bad, bad, condemn you as immoral and so on. But to recognize where you're making errors. Where you're maybe even evading. Where you're not true to your own principles. And that's the only way you can fix it. The only way to become more consistently rational, more consistently moral, more consistently pra- living by these principles is to introspect and evaluate the decisions you make, how you make them, and recognize when, you, when you're wrong. Recognize when you've let something influence you that you shouldn't have, when you didn't look at all the evidence when you didn't consider all the facts, when you let somebody influence you or you let your emotions, here's a common one, right? You let your emotions dictate your decision rather than your rational thinking. And it's only by recognizing that in you, before you start doing it to other people, before you start becoming judgmental about how other people behave and what other people do and how they do it, you first need to do it to yourself. And live up to your own declared standards. But it's not going to come automatically. This is the point I'm making. It doesn't come automatically. Just like knowledge is not automatic. Even when you gain the knowledge, applying the knowledge is not automatic. It doesn't just happen. It requires real effort. It requires monitoring. It requires introspection. It requires judging yourself, which is not easy, which requires a huge amount of honesty towards yourself, which is the most important aspect of honesty. True, be true to yourself. Know thyself. And none of that is easy. And it can, it can take years. So I know a lot of people, they read Alice Shrugged, they read God's Speech, maybe they read some fine man's nonfiction essays, and they're done. They know it all. It's completely integrated, they claim. They are now living it 100%. I don't believe it. It takes years to automatize. It takes years to integrate, integrate in order to automatize. The integration has to happen first. It's a long process, a difficult process, often a painful process of undoing all the bad things that you had accepted during your childhood, during your young adulthood, during the period where you weren't reading Ayn Rand, or even now because of the bombardment, the constant bombardment from the culture. The culture is not rational. The culture is not objectivist. The culture is not good. And we're all accepting stuff from the culture. And it's hard to, to filter constantly and to figure out what is and isn't true, what is and isn't influencing, or what is effect, what isn't effect. But that's the work that needs to be done. And it needs to be done by you, for you, with yourself, And it needs to be a constant, particularly when you're first learning these ideas. And I'm not trying to make this hard because it's it's this is a real positive. Because as you do this, you become better at living. Which is the goal. The goal is to be really, really good, world class, the best possible at living and ultimately at achieving happiness. All right. Um, let us see. All right, we've got some super chat questions. Of course, you can ask. 
the higher the dollar amount, the 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 more likely I will be. I it will be that I answer. Um, also, it's a, it's a way for you to reflect the uh, your appreciation or your trade with me in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the content you're receiving, if you view it as a value. All right. Uh, don't forget before you leave to like the show. We've got 83 likes. We should have over 100. Uh, and uh, don't forget to share the short videos, share this video if you found it interesting, and uh, find ways to support the show, whether in Super Chat, whether in youronbookshow.com slash support, subscribe star or Patreon. Um, you know, the show exists because of your support. The show would not exist without it. Um, and so thank you for those of you who support the show and those of you who do not yet support the show. I look forward to getting your support in the days, weeks, months to come. All right. Is guilt something we're born with or does it have to be taught? How do you know evil people are miserable? You Wow, this is a lot of questions. Uh, you know you would be miserable and guilt-ridden if you acted immorally regularly, but how do you know that is universal? Um, you're not born with guilt. I don't know what that even means, born with it. You know, you're certainly born with a capacity to feel guilty as part of the way we are built is we have the capacity to feel guilty. But we're not born with guilt. I don't certainly don't believe in original sin. You're not born in sin and therefore have to feel guilty from day one. What you feel guilty about is taught. So some people are taught to feel guilty about their virtues. You know, think of a mother Think of a mother who uh, uh, tells her kid that it's not right that they're so smart or that they're so able, that pulls them down constantly. You should feel terrible getting a higher grade than your brothers and sisters. Why are you working so hard? Just to make everybody else look bad? Why aren't you helping your mother? Are you studying instead? You should leave school, go to work. You should sacrifice. That's where, that gives meaning to your life. Every time you go out there and do what you think is fun, that is hurting people, that is bad. You you should feel guilty for that. And you could go on and on. I mean, Catholic and Jewish mothers have, have, have refined the art of eliciting guilt out of virtues. Guilt is an emotion that you feel when you have done something that contradicts your values and virtues. If you have values and bad values and virtues, then you will feel guilty when you violate them. When objectively you shouldn't feel guilty, you will. I call that unearned guilt. Why aren't you giving more to charity? You should give more to charity. Well, if charity is way up there on your hierarchy of values, then you're probably not giving enough to charity. So, So guilt is what you feel when you're not living up to your implicit moral principles. Implicit, I emphasize, because it's an emotion. So it's not, it takes time for the explicit values to be integrated so they become implicit, so your emotions follow. No idea what that means. Okay, so, uh, thank you, Shelley. How do you, so... uh, so guilt is, is a capacity we have, an emotional capacity. And what you feel guilty about depends on your values. And I would say when your values are irrational, you feel unearned guilt. When your values are rational, then, and you violate them, then the, the guilt is earned. It's justified. You should feel guilty. And the way to eliminate the guilt is to rectify 
what you did wrong. It's to fix it. It's to make it better. How do you know evil people are miserable? I mean, you know it by one introspection about yourself, but and you and you grant that. You know you would be miserable and guilt ridden if you acted immorally. That's yes. But you also can see it in other people. You can read it in literature. You can observe it throughout history. It is not true that when you look around the world and you look around your neighborhood and you look at history, that bad people live cool, successful, happy lives. I mean... And, it, and our art reflects that. And our art reflects that. Well, what was that movie I hated? Um, uh, it was a movie that came out during COVID. It was a, like a four-hour Martin Scorsese movie about the killing of Jimmy Hoffa. Right? And it was a movie about kind of the mafia, about a hitman and the mafia. And the one good thing about the movie, and most mafia movies do this, is they show that their lives are miserable. They don't really have any friends that they can trust, that they can really have a, 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 a beneficial relationship with. That they don't really have fun. That, uh, yeah, the movie was called The Irishman. That, you know, it, you see it in, 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 in people who drink too much or people who take drugs, that they can't escape their bad decisions. They can't escape their immoral actions. That there are consequences to it. And by the way, one of the great powers of literature, when it's good, is that even if it doesn't reflect a positive case, only Ayn Rand does in the sense of what is good and what is positive or what is... But great literature shows you what happens when people commit immoralities at the level that they commit them? Right? Ben, why are you advertising, I don't know, uh, I'm not even sure what it is, cars, trucks, motorcycles on my chat. It's, that's just weird. Australian dollars and how much they cost Australian dollars. Nobody here is buying. You're wasting your time. Um, so arts is, is, a, is a great place to find examples of this and to see it in action and you know or you read Dostoevsky you know people understand that certain immoralities lead to horrible consequences in people's psychology in people's action you know I watch this show um, I see I forget the show but think about the Godfather movies you know, so I'm, I'm using some popular stuff, but, but literature is even better. Um, think about the Godfather movies. Think about, uh, you know, some popular action movies portray the good guys as they sleep well and they have the girls and they have money and they live a happy life. But no, everybody knows that's not real at the end. But all you have to do is look. Look at the lives of of Hitler who has to commit suicide, kill his children and his, lo and his lover. Um, uh, talk to Bernie Madoff. Read a biography of Bernie Madoff and how miserable he was while he was pulling off the scam and that he felt happy when he was caught and he's happier now in jail than he was when he was rich with all this money he had stolen. R read biographies. Read autobiographies, what people write about themselves. And it, it, it's, not, it's not that hard to, to discover. Peaky Blinders is another good one. You know, if you watch Peaky Blinders, is another illustration of the, the psychological, mental, emotional damage that immorality, even immorality that is kind of, yeah, I had no choice, whatever, not living as a full human being, and I consider not living as a full human being, not exercising, the virtues appropriate to human life leads to a miserable life. And you, you can see it over and over and over again in your cousins, in your uncles, in your parents. And, and again, the, the misery 
is to that extent that they're irrational and their happiness is to that extent that they're rational. And again, you can see it over and over again. Somebody like Steve Jobs exuded a certain confidence and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, and a comfort in this world and a, and a certain happiness. Now, he wasn't as happy as he should have been, could have been. Indeed, if he'd been more rational, he might not have died when he died. So it had real existential consequences. But you can see it in successful people. And if you look at um, business books, uh, business books, good business books that, that you know, provide advice on how to be successful at business, they all repeat the same things. They repeat in, not in our language, but they basically articulate the objectivist virtues in other forms. They don't quite say, be rational. They might say, think and, and, uh, and only go by reality, only go by facts. I mean, honesty is always the integrity. You know. So to the extent people are successful, they're successful because they're applying these virtues implicitly or explicitly in some cases, but without having the entire framework. To the extent that they fail, they're not, and they're rejecting them. And don't get fooled by, you know, religious people that kind of look happy. I, you know, happiness is something deep and sustaining and meaningful and comes from a life of values, values in this world. All right. So, again, it's, it's I agree with you. You can't, you can't immediately extrapolate from your own experience, although... We are all human beings, so there's something you can extrapolate. For example, I extrapolate free will from my own experience. Um, but you can, this idea of misery, this idea of the, and, and look, the virtues and the values that Ayn Rand articulates, they are the result of her own introspection, but also observing other people and observing history. They come from reality. They're not logically derived principles that come from some other dimension detached from the real world. All new knowledge is fundamentally inductive knowledge. All new knowledge is fundamentally an induction from reality, from experiences in reality. All right, we need more Super Chat, guys. We need to make this a... Uh, you need to confirm... Troy's idea that topics like this are good idea, a, a good idea because, uh, I mean, it's going to be watched by fewer people than if I decided to talk about um, Trump leaving the hospital. That would have got like th a thousand more people watching it. So those of you who do watch it and appreciate it, got to show appreciation. Like, we're still not at 100. That's pathetic. You got to get to 100 likes. So like the show. Uh, let's see. Does seeing a psychologist mean you're weak and can't handle your own problems? No, 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 no. I mean, specialization is important. And knowledge is important. And you can't know everything. And it's like, I should have figured this all out myself. Why do I need to read Ayn Rand? Well, because she figured it out already. And she's going to give you shortcuts. And most of us, 99.99% of us, well, 99.99999% of us couldn't figure it out for ourselves. So absolutely, you want to learn from philosophers. And you don't say to yourself, I'm weak because I have to learn stuff from philosophers. You have to learn from mathematicians. If you want to study engineering, you have to learn from engineers. And... When it comes to your own psychology, particularly if you have real issues that you develop because of the irrationality of the culture, because of the irrationality of the world, because of the irrationality of how you grew up, then there are experts who can help you deal with that. Why not take advantage of it? It's absolutely not weakness. And there are certain psychological issues that are very difficult or almost impossible to do by yourself. They're too deep. They're too hard. 
Didn't I say psychologists? Psychologists, right? So it's, it's absolutely not weak to see a psychologist. I think it's the contrary. If somebody says, I know I've got problems, but I'm going to tough them out. Why? Life is not about toughening stuff out. Life is not about struggle. Life is not about pain. Life is not about suffering. If a, a, a psychologist, a good one, right, can help you overcome the challenges that you face quicker, easier, then use one. I said philosophers. Okay, I, I, I meant philosophers at first. Because we use philosophers to gain knowledge. We use mathematicians to gain knowledge. Engineering engineers to gain knowledge. All, specialization is wonderful. Why not use psychologists to gain knowledge about something that is psychological in nature? So absolutely it's not weak on the contrary. Not going to a psychologist is weak. All right, we've got a uh, we've got a abortion question. If a pregnant mother was killed, how would that play out in court? Just one count of homicide? Yes. Now, you could view it as more than just one case of homicide. I wouldn't make it two, but you want to view it as more because she is made she assuming she made the choice to have this child. So, this potential was going to become a reality. She had made the choice to make it a reality. And you had destroyed that choice. You had destroyed the ability to make it a reality. But it was her choice. So I still think it's one. But yeah, you could, you could, definitely, you could definitely say it's worse than just killing one person. Although, I, you know, it doesn't really matter. Once you kill one person, throw away the keys. You know, you kill three. So what, you throw away the keys three times? I mean, uh, Ashley says, thank you. You don't get points for struggling and toughing it out unnecessarily. Absolutely. Absolutely. Life is to be lived. And the sooner you get to living it in a healthy, productive, effective way, the better. Shortcuts are good. Again, uh, the whole mentality of it's unmanly to go to a psychiatrist comes from an altruistic framework where life is about toughing it out. It's about showing some pain. It's about suffering and having a hard time in life. Happiness, eh, nobody can be happy. And why be happy? It's selfish. So you shouldn't strive to it. You should, you should embrace your pain. Uh, okay, knowing that you're using previously discovered knowledge, does integrity require humility? Is humility anti-life? Uh, why? Yes, humility is anti-life. Because humility is not just saying, I can learn from other people. Humility says, I'm not worthy of learning. I'm not worthy of the knowledge. The fact that somebody else discovers it makes me unworthy of the knowledge. That's bizarre. Humility is the opposite of pride and self-esteem. It's I don't belong here. And I'm not worthy of anything. So hum the opposite of humility is not boastful arrogance. The opposite of humility is pride and self-esteem. And, and to have a view of because I didn't build the, you know, that bridge, then I'm humbled by it. It's absurd. Or, or I didn't discover the philosophy, and therefore I should, I, I don't deserve it in some sense. By the way, if you want to ask a question, if there's something you're interested in, use the super chat and uh, and uh, ask it through the super chat. I can't read the chat to answer your questions that way. Plus, I want to reward those who are willing to reward me. It's trade. So um, the fact that knowledge was previously discovered is something to be celebrated. It's, again, a shortcut. The purpose in life is not to suffer. It's not to discover everything. It's not to build everything from scratch. It's, 
It's to take all the knowledge you can that's being discovered and build on it. Whether it's in science, whether it's in engineering, whether it's in philosophy, whether it's in how you live your life. Build on the knowledge that's already been discovered. Celebrate the knowledge that has already been discovered and celebrate the fact that you understand that knowledge, that you can embrace that knowledge, integrate that knowledge, use that knowledge. So you're not just a, you know, if you're just a passive sponge, like I guess people like Sam Harris, in a sense, believe we are because we have no free will, then knowledge is meaningless. I mean, it's all meaningless. But you're not a passive sponge. You make an effort to see it, to achieve it, to, to, to integrate it, to understand it, and you should take pride in that and dump any remnants of humility you might have. Thank you, Lisa. Let's see, Varun asks, please talk about objectivist morality in view of victimhood politics of the day. Um, Kaufman drama triangle, victim, oppressor, rescuer. Um, I'm not sure, I don't know the Kaufman drama triangle, but victim, oppressor, rescuer is obvious, and it, it all comes from altruism, right? I mean, I, I remember when I was a kid, the culture was such that as kids in my classroom, we would compete on whose family was poorer. And you got points the poorer you could show your family was. Uh, poverty was the standard. Suffering was the standard. Um, hardship was the standard. That was virtue. Well, then, you know, that's a big part of that is, is the whole victimhood. Well, if virtue is suffering, then, all right, then let me be the victim. And, of course, the rescuer is the person who rescues you out of victimhood. And he is the hero because he is altruistic. He's doing it for you. And, of course, your victimhood is not self-inflicted because that would make, I don't know, that would make you, it wouldn't make you, uh, uh, um, a bad person necessarily, but it's much better if the victimhood is caused by others. If there is an oppressor out there, if there's somebody evil that has done this to you. Right? So, people out there celebrate their own victimhood. They know exactly who to blame for it. There's always an oppressor out there the system, and then somebody writes to the rescue, the socialist, and they can sacrifice themselves or others to the victim to help them rise up out of victimhood until the next oppressor comes around. And of course, objectivism rejects all of that. I mean, they can be oppressors, but then they have to be objectively shown to be oppressors. They can be victims, but victimhood is not something to be celebrated. Victimhood is something to be escaped. And that the ultimate responsibility for escaping victimhood is on you as an individual. And you are the rescuer. There's no other rescuer that's going to rescue you. It's you, your responsibility, your life. So, I mean, the whole victim, oppressor, rescuer takes responsibility away from you, places it on others, on the other, which is what the morality of altruism demands. Everything is focused on the other. All right. Um, how do you think Robert Downey Jr. turned his life around? He was at a very low point, and now he is a big star. I mean, I don't know Robert Downey Jr.'s a specific life story, but a lot of people who are down lift themselves out. And I, I, I think they do it by taking responsibility over their own life. They don't have to embrace and understand and, and or have knowledge of the objectivist um, ethics. And look, there have been people throughout history who've used these virtues, who've acted in pursuit of these values without 
articulating them quite in the way Ayn Rand does, without organizing them. I mean, human <laughs> human life, we would still be in the dark, in 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 prehistoric times. If to some extent people were practicing these virtues and values throughout human history. So, and, and some of these are even integrated into pop psychology, integrated into self-help books, even integrated into, I don't know, uh, uh, um, what is it? Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. There is a knowledge out there that you have to take responsibility for yourself. There's a knowledge out there generally in a folksy kind of way that one has to think long term. There's the knowledge out there that thinking is important. There's a, there, there are certain principles out there. You know, lots of people think honesty is a good thing without being fully objectivist. What objectivism gives you is an integrated whole all focused on you being successful and happy. And it's integrated with no conflicts internally to it. So it gives you the best chance at this. But Robert Downey Jr. at some point, through somebody's help or by himself, figured out that he could take control of his own mind and therefore could take control of his own life, that he wasn't a puppet, that he wasn't a victim, that he, wa- that he didn't need an external rescuer, that in a sense he could rescue himself, and did it, whether consistently or inconsistently. I don't know enough about his life. And I think that's true of every person who has risen up. They take responsibility, they think for themselves, and they become productive. That's the components of a, of a good life. And the extent to which you do that consistently is the extent to which your life will be good. To the extent that you do it inconsistently, you can have a mixed life. So how does anybody lift themselves out given the culture? they discover better ideas. And some of those better ideas are in the culture. Again, look at the self-help literature. It maps on in various areas in inconsistent ways to the objectivist ethics because, again, history, psychology, looking at people and evaluating people, the principles of what makes a good life are out there. Again, objectivism gives it to you in a you know in a in a way that is grounded in reality and grounded in a, a, a philosophical structure and a structure of principles, but any success, a semi-successful self-help manual is going to have to be implicitly using some of those same principles. Just like as I said, every successful business has to practice reason, has to practice honesty, has to practice integrity, has to practice productiveness, whether they self-identify it explicitly or not. Why is the popular conception of self selfishness package deal with sacrificing to others? How does rational selfishness facilitate social relationships? Now, that's a big question, and we'll, we'll talk more about that as we move through this kind of program of, of, um, of episodes. But let me quickly say, selfishness is package deal because the altruists want it to be package deal. They want you to think of Bernie Madoff and Steve Jobs together as both being selfish because it makes you doubt Steve Jobs, and it makes you doubt the whole morality of selfishness if it's associated with Bernie Madoff. So they don't want you to think for yourself. They don't want you to think about your own well-being. They don't want you to enjoy the fruits of your own labor. They want your sacrifice. So they have to paint selfishness as leading to being an SOB, as leading to lying, cheating, and stealing. They have to unite it. They create that package deal. I would argue at some level purposefully and then they maintain it they constantly 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 maintain it they constantly constantly emphasize it re-emphasize it right no bernie madoff's not an altruist bernie madoff is a parrot is a is a is a is a um ugh, is an exploiter he is a expect other people to sacrifice to him 
he, he uh, thank you, Richard. It's very, very, uh, very um, generous. Bernie Madoff is, the, is not an altruist, but he's not an egoist. But what happens is they lump together Bernie Madoff and Steve Jobs under the same context of selfish. Bernie Madoff's not selfish. Bernie Madoff is self-destructive. Bernie Madoff is a loser. So he's not selfish. He's selfless. But he's not an altruist. He's selfless without being an altruist. To be an altruist means to be selfless and sacrifice to others. To be a self-destructive selfless person, to be a, um, a, a, a predator, which is what Bernie Madoff is, you sacrifice other people to you. It's still selfless, but it's a different form of selflessness. Right? So it's important not to view the world as there's altruism and there's egoism. There's also these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, predators who sacrifice other people to them, who are not selfish, they're not egoists, and they're not altruists. And I know thinking in more than twos is hard, but there are three categories here, at least. It's not clear that religious person sacrificing to God is real altruism. Because they're not sacrificing the others, they're sacrificing something. So it's it's a form of selflessness, but it's not necessarily the, the typical altruistic form of selflessness. Hedonism is selfless. That's right. It's not selfish. It's selfless. So again, the categories of selflessness. But there's only one form of selfishness. There's on, only one form of doing right. There are many forms of doing wrong. All right. Um, let's see. We had... Stephen asked, do you like survival movies like The Edge? The Edge was very good. I, haven't, I don't think I've seen Castaway. They're usually great at showing how using reason is linked to survival. Many also show that a sense of optimism and confidence is, is necessary. Is that so? Yes. I mean, The Edge in particular... Um, the 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 I mean it's one of the few movies where the hero is a successful businessman, and he uses reason explicitly, and he emphasizes the use of reason in his survival, and he's constantly innovating and thinking. And so the edge in particular, what's the name of the actor who stars in it? Um, uh, ah, I forgot his name. I can see his face, but I can't remember his name. Anyway, it's it's very good. It's one of the better ones. And I think Castaways, you know, a lot of these movies have that because the only way to survive is by using your mind. And most directors, writers can't get away from that. So they express it, right? Um, a lot of, a lot of, a the better action movies have the same thing. So a movie like Aliens, the second Alien, explicitly uh, celebrates rationality. The only person who survives is the person who's rational, who's thinking. Yes, Anthony Hopkins was in The Edge. Very, very good movie. Um, and Alec Baldwin is the bad guy. But Anthony Hopkins is a good guy. He's a businessman, and he, and, he, and, and he uses the same skill he uses his business to survive. And it's very well dramatized. So, um, yeah, so Aliens is another example. The other movies, the better action movies, have a hero that is a thinking hero versus just an acting hero. And, and it, they concretize the thinking. And Aliens, the second alien, uh, does that well. All right, we're almost done. If some decisions are rational but others pragmatic, is the key to correcting the error finding the motive behind the decision? Yes. Why are you being pragmatic here? Why are you not sticking to your principles? Is it the lack of understanding of the applicability of the principles? Is it there's some emotional issue that is driving you? Is there some emotional issue that is motivating you, that is influencing you? Are you, are you not consistently being independent, for example? Are you not consistently being rational by letting emotions intervene? So, um, yes, a lot of it has to do with why are you not being principled consistently? And if you can discover that, you can fix it. 
What do you think is the meaning behind when a person takes comfort in saying he is only a speck of dust in the universe? I mean, I think it's, um, first of all, I think it's popular. It's, it's, it's considered, you know, uh, cool, woke, whatever. But I, but I, because it's, it's popular to, to demean humanity, to, to, to think of us as little, as small, as insignificant. Um, it's to, it's to make yourself small and thus not create expectations, to make yourself small so you're not overly ambitious, to make yourself small so when you fail, you can just say, well, I failed, you know, what can we do? We're just a speck in the universe. Um, you know, a, a healthy psychology admires great achievement and strives to that. Uh, it doesn't view nature as an achievement. Nature just is. Nature's pretty in a sense, but it's not an achievement. So you're not a, you, you know, you measure yourself against other things human, not against things that are not choices, not actions of human beings. Andy asks, have you seen Westworld? Also Anthony Hopkins in season one. What do you think about the morality involved with robot people? I have not seen Westworld. I mean, if the robots have free will, then they need to be treated as, and, and they can conceptualize, that is, the, which free will necessitates, then I think they, they have to be treated as humans. There's a good show on one of the English channels called Humans that I think dealt with that pretty well. Uh, humans, uh, there were, I think, two or three seasons and to the extent that they are self-conscious, that they have free will, that they are conceptual beings, they have to be treated with rights. And I, I haven't seen Westworld, so I don't know what happens there. All right. Uh, watch Humans, though. Humans is very good. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you to all the super chatters. Um, I really appreciate the support and the, uh, the um, yeah, the, the, the support that that reflects. Thank you for all watching. Don't forget to like the show before you leave. Don't forget to share the show. Don't forget to tell your friends about the show. And those of you who'd rather support me on a monthly basis, which is my preferred way as well, you can go and do that on your onbookshow.com slash support, on Patreon, on Subscribestar, and even on Locals. So uh, thanks, everybody. I will see you all on Wednesday, Wednesday evening, and uh, probably we'll see what the topic will be then. Probably a more political topic on Wednesday. Bye, everybody. See you soon.